Welcome to the final video of Chapter 1, covering Section 1.7 in your textbook. This video is all about the language of medicine. We're going to be talking about how our modern terminology came to be from the Greek and Latin roots that it started from. We're also going to learn what eponyms are and how to recognize them. We're going to talk about why it's so important to use medical terminology properly. And finally, at the very end, we'll be talking about some specific medical imaging techniques and when they can be most helpful in making a diagnosis. About 90% of the medical terms that we use right now come from a bank of 1,200 Greek and Latin root words. There's a really great website that puts these root words together very efficiently. I'm going to post a link in D2L because I think you might find some of the information on that website interesting. So look for that in D2L close to where this video is posted. This terminology during the Renaissance era did cause a lot of confusion, though. There wasn't a standardized naming practice from country to country, and some things were called by several different names. So there were two big efforts, one in 1895 and one in 1998, to standardize the, the terminology that we use in biology and especially anatomy and physiology. A tool that will be really helpful to you in the back of your textbook, there's a glossary with over 400 words and components of words that you can use to figure out what different words mean. Scientific terms are often formed by having a root or a stem and then adding prefixes and some subfixes to that word to specify a particular meaning. We also use a lot of acronyms in medical terminology. For instance, a PET scan would more formally be called a positron emission tomography scan, but that is quite a mouthful to say over and over and quickly. So we just call it a PET scan. The rules for forming plural words vary from word to word. Also, adjective forms of words have uh, variations in how related words are formed. In a lot of cases, these are just things that have to be learned as you study. And also, adjectives can be very, very important. When we talk about muscles, the biceps brachii is in your arm. You probably know exactly where it is. It's your upper arm. That's very different than your biceps femoris, which is in your thigh. Okay. So if we want to be very specific about something, we can't refer to the bicep in our arm just as the bicep. We have to include brachii in order to make it clear which bicep we're talking about because humans technically have two. You have some resources for pronunciation in your textbook. There are pronunciation guides and in the anatomy and physiology revealed software that you have through Connect, there is some uh, pronunciation guidance there as well. In anatomy and physiology, and especially if you go into any field involving patient care, it's absolutely essential that you are very precise with your language and with your writing and with your numbers and with your spelling. There are some really common mistakes that get made, okay? For instance, brachy and bronchi. They sound very similar. They're worded fairly similarly, um, or they're spelled similarly. They mean totally different things, arm and windpipe. Uh, brachy and brady, short and slow, respectively. Uh, I embarrassed myself once in talking to a professor because I referred to the field of myology or the study of muscles as mycology, which is the study of fungus and not really at all related. This one is huge. If you're doing anything with medicine, a lot of times we, we want to say cc as in cubic centimeter as a unit of volume. Uh, one cc written quickly and sloppily looks an awful lot 
awful lot like 100. And if we were trying to say one cc of epinephrine, for instance, and the person administering the drug read it as 100 cc's, very commonly a patient will get 100 times whatever dosage was actually indicated. For this reason, we avoid using cc as a measurement. A lot of times we'll use milliliters instead. Uh, in order to care for patients correctly, we need to be very precise in how we write and how we speak to avoid confusion and mistakes. Now on to the medical imaging section. So everybody has seen x-rays. Uh, by the time you get to college age, I suspect most people have actually had an x-ray at some point in their life. Uh, an x-ray simply shows dense tissue as white. This makes up over half of all the medical imaging that we do. It's fairly cheap. It's fairly easy. It's non-invasive. It does have the disadvantage of exposing the body to radiation. And so we want to avoid using x-rays excessively. However, infrequently, when necessary, they're a great tool. You guys can see this is what a chest x-ray looks like in a healthy individual. And I pulled this today. This is what a pneumonia in a COVID-19 patient looks like. Um, this is the heart. And you can see the lungs are fairly clear and free. And here there's a lot more cloudiness that um, dense tissue is fluid that's filling the lungs and causing congestion and illness. We can use radiopaque substances. Um, they can be swallowed. Uh, barium is very frequently used for this. And this is what we use when we want to see inside of a hollow structure. So this is the GI tract of a patient who has swallowed barium. Uh, they can also be injected. And when we do that, we can see the insides of blood vessels. CT scans, we used to call them CAT scans, but we don't anymore. CT scans use less x-rays and they take slices of an image. So you can see here, this is a slice off the very top of someone's head. Um, obviously their head wasn't physically sliced, it's done using the imagery. And this is a, a slightly deeper slice and deeper and deeper and then through the brain, we can see the image maybe at the level of the eyeballs. And then this is, you can see here, we have the sinuses exposed. So this is going to be at the level of like the, the cheeks and below the, below the nose. And then up here, this is going to be closer to like a slice taken at the chin, for instance. And again, I want to be very clear, this person was not physically cut off. The imaging allows slices to be seen, and so we can see what's going on at different depths. MRIs are also very common. Most of us know someone who has had an MRI. MRIs are really good for looking at soft tissue instead of bone or uh, things like that. So in an MRI, a person is exposed to a very strong magnet. And that magnet interacts with the hydrogen atoms in the body and realigns them. And as the hydrogen atoms slightly change their position, they give off energy. And different tissues with different concentrations of hydrogen atoms give off energy at different levels. And that can be seen in imaging. So that's what an MRI is. PET scans, positron emission tomography. These are really, really good for detecting cancer. What a PET scan does is lights up or visualizes areas of the body that are doing metabolism very quickly, okay? We know that cancer metas metabolizes sugars very quickly. So a lot of times a PET scan is used to locate tissues in the body that are doing fast metabolism, and those are often assumed to be cancer. If the, uh, the scans look different from a known healthy patient. Uh, it's analyzed by a computer and um, it, it just shows where glucose is being used 
at the moment the scan is done. And finally, we have sonographs. I think most people have seen a sonograph at some point. Uh, we generally use this in obstetrics when we're looking at the development of a fetus. Benefits, they're, they're not harmful. We, we don't have x-rays or other forms of radiation being used. Uh, it's based on sound waves. Disadvantage is the images aren't very sharp. So if something abnormal is visualized during the sonograph, uh, another visualization technique may need to be done in order to, to check out what's specifically going on.